So welcome to this panel discussion on circular economy and global value chains in the context of the Global Solutions Summit of 2022. This is a virtual session, uh, but we do have in fact public also here uh, at the venue of the summit in Berlin listening to the session. We can have uh, some interactivity, interaction, Q&A. Um, we have an outstanding uh, panel today, which I will now introduce with Charles Wong, founder and chairman of Circular Taiwan Network, who is joining from San Francisco very, very, very early morning. Neil Guntas, Deputy Director of the Department of Environment and Division Chief for Industrial Resource Efficiency at UNIDO. Uh, Astrid Lagefoged, Head of Unit Planetary Common Goods, Universal Values and Environmental Security at the European Commission. Um, Mohamed Jan Revindo, Head of Business Climate and Global Value Chain Research Group at uh, the Institute for Socioeconomic Research at the University of Indonesia. Alexander Godoy, Founders, Associate Professor and Director of the Sustainability Research Center at University del Tesarolo in Chile, and Najma Mohamed, Policy Director, Green Economic Coalition in the UK, uh, Isabella Teixeira, Co-Chair of UNEP International Resource Panel and former Minister of the Environment of Brazil, especially during the COP21, has kindly agreed to give a few thoughts and closing and closing remarks. So today our approach to circular economy will really be about value, global value and supply chains. And we will circulate across three dimensions, policy making, academia and research, and civil society. I'm Nicholas Bouchou, I'm co-chairing the T20 Indonesia Task Force on Infrastructure and also uh, participating to a number of global initiatives and editorial uh, in initiatives about the development of circular economy. I'm delighted to be with you. Uh, we have 45 minutes, so with no further ado, Charles, I will pass it on to you for uh, a, a couple of opening words and statements uh, for today's discussion. Charles, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, thank, good day, uh, everyone, and thank you, Nicholas. And also, I'd like to thank uh, Sophia for her technical assistance. Uh, my, my name is Charles Wang, and I'm the founder and chairman of the uh, Circular Taiwan Network, uh, which is a nonprofit organization founded in 2015 in Taiwan. Our foundation's uh, mission is to bring the key stakeholders and communities, like all of you, together to bend, so-called bending the, the, the increasingly antiquated linear economy uh, with a more regenerative and inclusive form of circular economy. And despite global commitment uh, to mitigate the climate crisis during the last 30 years, uh, yet unfortunately, most strategies and solutions to date remain fragmented and parochial, resulted in very little to no impact, as evidenced in the haphazard agreement made in the COP26 last year. And there's no single country, as I, I think I mentioned that before, uh, nor single company can bend the linear chain by itself. All companies and countries must be brought together, like what we are doing now, to collectively bend the highly degenerative form of supply chains and to transform the chains to become a more closed loop and regenerative circular value network. In other words, if we were to achieve any meaningful results in bending the linear chain, it is only possible when all stakeholders can collaborate together in their respective supply and value creation network. What we have seen is there are two major paradigm shift uh, that are critical to bending the linear model, so to speak, and to redesign a closed loop circular value network. First, so-called the true cost must apply to all stakeholders. What I mean by true cost is that as long as in the linear context, privatizing profits and publicizing costs 
are accepted as the norm in our daily lives, in our daily businesses, then our personal and commercial decisions and economic choices will continue to be in, in conflict with our societal well beings and environmental resiliency. Worse even, they may even be destructive to our livelihood and in contradiction uh, to the values and purposes of humanity. The second paradigm shift required is that no more what we call buck passing games. Uh, buck passing game means that the sad truth is that we generally in the name of corporate profitability or economic growth, or even under the facade of social prosperity, passing the externalities or cost and risk from one company or one country to the others has been widely accepted as the necessary evil. Actually, as we speak, the externalities generated along the linear supply chain is being passed from one company or one country to the next in the world today. Therefore, the burden to eradicate the externalities is typically passed from major brand owners to the OEM manufacturers and onto the raw material suppliers and then to the laborers working in the factories and the fields and the miners in remote villages. Consequently, it is the production and raw material supplying nations and the developing and underdeveloped nations who actually bore the brunt of the externalities, such as the pollutants to the air we breathe, the water we drink, and the soil we grow food from. So what should we do? It is clear that the existing linear supply chain, if remain unchanged and unchallenged, will continue to harm our environment and to widen our social divide and remain vulnerable to geopolitical disruptions. Therefore, from where we are in Taiwan, a strategic and integral part of today's global manufacturing technology and logistic hub, there exist great opportunities to bend the linear model in favor of a circular model and to redesign a resilient closed loop circular value, value network or what we call CVN, which is a network free from the degenerativeness and extractiveness of privatizing profits, I said earlier, publicizing costs and bug passing of externalities. Finally, we believe it is our generational responsibility. There is no shortcut in bending the linear economy and redesigning circular value network. We must get organized, walk our talks, show our commitment by accelerating what we call CC4CC in short or circular collaboration for climate crisis dialogues to address and find solutions to the root causes of carbon emissions and all externalities systematically and collectively with the ultimate goal for a closed loop and resilient circular economy. With that, uh, thank you for all your attention and let me turn the floor back to Nicholas. Thank you. Charles, thank you very much. This uh, is a perfect setting for, um, is for the discussion. Nilgun, you have been um, instrumental within UNIDO um, to develop global consultations on, on circular economy and you have been in this area for um, a number of years. How would you, uh, how would you view uh, this call for system uh, transformations and the very powerful, um, simple approach that was uh, described by Charles Huang about this passing on the externalities? Nilgun, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, good day to everyone. Uh... And thank you, Charles, for setting the stage so well. Uh, I will follow from uh, what you said uh, and try to respond to the question posed by Nicholas. You mentioned we need to, everybody has to get on board. We need, we need global solutions to our global challenges. Uh, I, I'm from UNIDO, United Nations Industrial Development Organization. And our mandate is to promote within the UN uh, SDGs, all the SDGs, but specifically 
our mandate is to promote inclusive and sustainable industrial development, which is the high ambition of all developing countries in the world. We did, we conducted some regional preparatory meetings, uh, which culminated in global consultations. And all of these exchanges revealed insights on both the progress made and constraints faced uh, for a just transition to circular economy by our 170 member states. And we learned a lot. What did we learn? That there were numerous circularity initiatives underway in many economies, both in the global north and the global south, at all levels, communities, cities, the business community, national, local, regional governments. But indeed, as Charles said, these were fragmented throughout all the types of stakeholder groups. Very promising outcomes, which was pleasantly, very pleasant for us as well, for addressing climate change, biodiversity loss and pollution came about onto the table, accompanied also by with positive outcomes for new and more decent jobs, enhanced competitiveness, and improved well-being of people. However, Unfortunately, policy frameworks, for example, on climate change today, focus mainly on energy transitions and taking, car taking carbon out. Do we take carbon out and do business as usual? In fact, energy transitions and energy efficiency is necessary, but not sufficient to address these global and interlinked climate, uh, biodiversity and pollution crises. It has a global and just transition to circular economies has the potential to address the missing half, the 50% of what is missing in the climate discourse while uh, creating prosperity for all. Very importantly, our Information exchanges and experience sharing also de 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 demonstrated that economies in the global south could continue on inclusive and sustainable industrialization pathways and at the same time embark on a just transition to circular economies. This is very important if we can make the mindset change the, uh, the holistic change that circularity requires. What do they need? What do the developing economies need? They need financial resources for circular investments, innovations, technology transfer, capacity building, how to measure large scale awareness uh, raising and very importantly, training and education of future generations, not only us, but also the future generations. So uh, that uh, uh, we call uh, our linear and circular economies, industrial economies. Uh, why do we do that? Because, uh, shall I stop? No, it's, we, we, can, we can get back to that. Uh, All right. All right. In, Thank in, you. In a minute, uh, I get passionate and lose <laughs> track of time. Thank you. So uh, this is why I was raising my hand. But in any case, one thing which you mentioned, which is absolutely critical, and this is coming up in a number of discussions, uh, business or policy or research. This is this is the other half of how to complete uh, uh, the overall uh, climate goals uh, through resources and economic transformations. I want to mention that in the context of the Global Solutions Summit, uh, we have been issuing a call for action uh, together with a number of the speakers here um, about that. And th there is some evidence that the development of circular economy could really help boost, uh, not in 50 years, but in a couple of years, um, uh, the achievement of the 
of the of the Paris Agreement. So I think this is very very substantial. Thank you very much, Neil Gun. We will get back to that. Astrid, um, the European Commission is doing a lot uh, regarding the development of circular economy, both in Europe and also globally. How would you comment on the issues of system transformation and policy making at this moment in a landscape that was described as changing, but also very fragmented? Astrid, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Nicola, and thank you for um, inviting me to speak on this fascinating and very important topic. And I think as as um, the two previous speakers have already alluded to, and as, as you are alluding to now with the, the need for systemic solutions, I think it's important that we really look at these interconnected environmental challenges. So there's climate change on the one hand, there's biodiversity loss, and there's pollution in a broader sense. And as we are really running out of time and resources, we need to tackle those in a way that we tackle them all at the same time. And circular economy really has a crucial role here. If we think about it, for example, the International Resource Panel has estimated that 90% of the impacts on biodiversity and water and roughly half of the greenhouse gas emissions and one third of the impacts on human health are linked to one thing, and that's the extraction and processing of material resources, which is really at the core of what we want to do with this, taking a more circular approach. I think your, your um, summit today is also indeed touching, and previous speakers touched on this issue about the global supply chains that needs to become more sustainable and also more resilient also to face the various uh, crises we have seen with the pandemic and uh, now we have a war in Europe. Um, so the EU is now really placing circular economy at the heart of what we call the European Green Deal. And we have taken, as you mentioned, quite a lot of actions. We, we look at things like plastic, construction, textiles and so on, but I want to keep uh, pushing this notion that the systemic approach is important. So there's many things that are important, but always keeping an eye on, on the overall thing. So for example, when we've been looking at textiles, we see that each garment, if it was used twice as many times before it was disposed, we could actually save 49% of the emissions along the whole value chain. Um, and of course, these are not things that the EU can, can do alone. So as we're discussing here, we need global, global challenges, needs global efforts. And we're really trying to, to spearhead some of these things in our cooperation with third countries, notably with developing countries and emerging markets. Um, just as an example, uh, what we have done together with UNEP and UNIDO is that we have launched what we call the Global Alliance on Circular Economy and Resource Efficiency. And that is really to take forward the circular economy agenda at global level. We currently have uh, 15 member countries and, and three strategic partners. But what we're also really happy to see is that so many similar initiatives are springing up around the world. We see the African Circular Economy the Alliance, the Latin American and the, or the Caribbean Circular Economy Coalition. So we really want that people, when they hear about the circular economy, they may think of recycling plastic bottles and so on. But plastic bottles or recycling is, is just one issue. The circular economy is so much more. It's really getting to rethink these business models. And as Charles said, also think about the externalities and how governments can ensure that they are taking into account across the life cycle of um, products. So we need to rethink how we design and how we produce. And um, we shouldn't think of circular economy as an end in itself. It's really a tool that can contribute in a very systemic way to not only address the environmental crisis, but also other facets of sustainable um, development. I'm really glad that Neil Gwen also highlighted the grub, uh, job and growth potential, because I think this is also key to taking this approach forward. Thank you. Thank you very much, Astrid. Just one quick question, and we can further elaborate on that with, uh, together with Mohamed Jan Revindo and Alexander Godoy, is um, you mentioned there is the, uh, there are diverse alliances and coalitions which are being formed, right, in different regions. 
what would it take uh, for those alliances, partnerships, coalitions uh, to lead toward, towards a more institutional uh, uh, change and leapfrog into organizing the circular economy, common definitions, common targets, etc. Maybe very briefly, Neil Gunn and Astrid, before we move on with our conversation, and may, Charles, if you have a comment. Neil Gunn, you need to uh, unmute yourself. Thanks a lot. Uh, I'm the focal point in UNIDO for the GASEREC, the Global Alliance, and we work closely with these regional alliances. And from our consultation, our 170 member states expressed willingness for a global definition, principles, global principles, which could guide them, and even a framework on how to move forward. Everybody realizes, I think, and we are at a very good uh, position at this time, that we have to all collaborate. Uh, with Gasere, we do global advocacy with the regional alliances, uh, they focus on, and we are part, both UNEP and UNIDO are part of these, among other partners, strategic partners, they focus on creating joint programs where these commonalities could be built in. Uh, so we are very, very happy to see these regional initiatives and they need to expand. Astrid? Maybe Astrid would want to take that. Thank you. Yeah. No, indeed. I think uh, it's really an iterative process, right? We we launch something, we stimulate that we then go and discuss it and make it concrete where it's relevant. And, and we see a lot of these uh, more local alliances. Now I, I mentioned regional alliances, but of course there's a lot happening at a lot of levels of stakeholder engagement. But then I would say that all helps to also push these topics back so we get to have an agenda in the UN. And I think it's really about ensuring also that we maybe can cement some of this work. The more we get agreement uh, and, and the push up of things that work, the more we will be able to make real progress also together in the UN. Thank you. Thank you very much. Charles, maybe a comment, then we continue our discussion with the point of view of uh, Mohamed Revindo and Alexander Godoy. Yeah, I think uh, I'd like to, to, to sort of support uh, all the speakers uh, about the need to, to really talk about this issue systemat systematically. Circular economy is more than just waste to resources. It's about, you know, the business model need to change. And in fact, even fundamental than that, the lifestyles need to change. In other words, the root cause of all the problem we have today is actually the problem of a linear economy, which is an extractive one. Until we all agree on that fundamentally, despite what we you know, perhaps uh, try to, to, to compromise politically and whatnot, it is important to know that unless the economic model changes on the both supply side and the demand side of the behavior, and the supply side, as I said, on the manufacturing side, it is almost impossible to mitigate the crisis we are facing, be it climate crisis or health issues and, 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 and social divide and all these issues. So I think uh, we do have an agreement on that. I'm happy to hear that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Charles. Um, Mohamed, the floor is yours with a perspective from research, but also a perspective from Southeast Asia, Indonesia. Yeah. And the yes. Uh, thank you, Nicola. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm not really, really uh, into a green economy. I'm, I'm looking from more on the perspective of social inclusion, but uh, it will be somehow related to green economy as well. So uh, to, to my view, uh, GVC is good for the global economy on the one hand, because it spread the economic activity in different countries. However, um, there, there's still some inclusiveness issue in the GVC. There, there are at least five dimensions of inclusiveness. Uh, the social economic perspective, of course. The first is that there is unequal distribution of margin uh, uh, along the production chains in different countries. That's the first uh, 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 inclusiveness issue. The second is there's still low levels of local sourcing. So the multinational enterprise, they are everywhere, but they, they very rarely they, they 
they, uh, uh, you know, built, uh, they purchased from local companies and, and even lower the participation of local small and medium enterprise. And also there's, uh, although the uh, economic activity are spread across the, the, the countries, there is still low job opportunities for less educated and less skilled local workers. That's another issue of inclusiveness. And finally, uh, firms participating in GPCs are rarely located in uh, less uh, remote uh, in remote areas or in, in less developed areas. They they will be located in uh, already developed areas. So so in create more imbalance within uh, some uh, some uh, within the countries in some developing countries. So there's five dimension of social uh, inclusive uh, inclusiveness issue. So what are the risks if if that that things uh, keep happening? The first is that the the the, the highest risk is that the developing countries government will see that there is they they are not fully supporting the GPC. They say, oh, it's, it doesn't bring a lot of benefit for our society. It, it, it will only bring some benefit to the elites part of the society. So in that sense, if there is another kind of uh, pandemic happen, all the governments will be inward looking. They will they will, will they will be saying, oh, I will I will put my nation interests first because the multinational enterprise. Do not, do not really give uh, benefit to the lower to the lower uh, part of the society. So what, what do we do? What, what can we do? Uh, this is some, some uh, way, uh, uh, some light in the end of the tunnel. The first is maybe we can, uh, we can promote, uh, accelerate the end-to-end uh, -end digitalization among SMEs. Uh, what, what we mean by digitalization is not only onboarding only commerce marketplace, but also the whole business process, including the purchasing materials, the uh, payroll system, uh, let them embrace uh, the digitalization. And also the digital literacy is important because in some areas in developing countries, when there is stronger internet connection, there are, there are more poor, uh, the, the poverty rate is higher because when the internet connection is strong, then, uh, you know the, the poor families will buy data for their activities but not necessarily necessarily uh, productive activities <laughs> so uh, digital digital literacy is important and then uh, awarding multinational enterprise uh, who empower local uh, smes with some i don't know maybe some incentives uh, and also uh, you know social upgrading and cohesion for entrepreneurs and workers uh, i'll give you uh, to to close this uh, discussion uh, my my view I will give you uh, maybe just to provoke the discussion, uh, Nicola. Uh, the inclusiveness will be related to the green economy. Let me give you, uh, give you two examples. In 10 years from now, in Indonesia, in Southeast Asia, there will be high demand for electric stove, right? My question is, how, where will be the role of SMEs in that? Are we preparing them to supply the component of electric stove, uh, small components, they can do it, or we will be leaving them behind and then they will be again they will be they will be cutting trees again they will be you know uh, uh, using natural resource uh, because that's the, the, the last thing they, they they have and also when when there's more demand on electric vehicle how about the um after sale service the, their smes uh, their smes doing a car service and a motorbike service how how can we prepare them to also enjoy the benefit of those uh, uh, energy trans transition. I think just something to start with. Thank you, Nico. <laughs> it's, it's actually much more than something to start with. It's uh, <laughs> absolutely, I think, uh, the critical notes uh, of a number of uh, the issues that are linked with the development of, um, of circular economy. Maybe, Alexander, just bef before coming to you, uh, our colleague Najma Mohamed uh, uh, with the Green uh, Economy Coalition is working a lot on these issues of social justice from, from this perspective, and we will get back to you in a minute. How do you react to what uh, uh, Mohamed uh, uh, mentioned? And I think for the Green Economy Coalition, and we the world's largest sort of coalition working on the transition to green and fair economies, people are absolutely at the center of this transition. If we're wanting to achieve the type of transition that we need, that's broad based, has deep societal support, we absolutely need to, to engage with, uh, with local communities, with workers, um, to be able to ensure that we have their, their buy-in. And so circular economy models, rather than being about, you know, um, innovative um, technological solutions should be also about um, inclusivity 
It should be you know, non-discriminatory. Um, they should promote the equitable distribution of opportunity and outcome to make sure that actors who were excluded from um, economic activity become part of these innovative um, solutions. And they should be based on, on solidarity and social justice. We, we're speaking about global supply chains. Mm -hmm. This is going to take, I think, an integrated effort of the type of policy and regulatory systems that can ensure this accountability. But it's going to need um, demand from, from workers and citizens, and it's going to need solidarity. We, we need to speak about, I think, this notion of, of solidarity. We need consumers to demand that the processes and the goods that they um, consume are, um, you know, uh, sourced and produced and distributed in, uh, in, in a fair and, and equitable way. And uh, I would like to see us speak, speaking in a couple of years, not about fair trade or about green supply chains as a niche anymore. That should be the way that we do business. And so I really love the fact that Charles has iterated in your remarks, Charles, the fact that we need to ask fundamental questions about the choices we make, the lifestyles we are, you know, we, we living and the type of economies um, yeah. uh, that we want. Thank you. And we will get back to you maybe about how to institutionalize such a call for the demand of mobilization of workers and the call for solidarity. Alexander, you have been also working in different dimensions of uh, a circular economy, transboundary, producer responsibility and so on. So what would be uh, your vision of the, of the priorities at this moment regarding circular economy? And good day, everyone. And apologies for my accent. I am a Chilean trying to speak in English, so my Spanish English is not so good. But I would like to say something different uh, because and all, around the world, all notes and what's the mean circular economy, and all people know that the, the recycling is not just an, an circular economy. We have another kind of arts like a, a refurbished, refurbished, and so on. My main concern, according to our studies, is the a responsibility, the, the, the extent the producer of responsibility. Why are you talking about? And the, we, we, we have a big gap between developed nations and developing nations. I can agree with my colleague and, and before that the social inclusions, but suppose that and if you are exporting, you, if you are the big brand with the headquarters in Europe, for example, and the manufacturers, the supply chain is located in China or in Asia, and you are exporting the goods for the global south and the final destination in South America or in Africa. And if you if you are going to this kind of country, my country, we don't have the facilities to sorting, recovering materials, secondary markets, and so on. And all people say this is a big opportunity for economy, but it's not true. Why, right now, and in, in, in different countries, they are adopting the EPR law, but the EPR law has the, the, the final destination in the global south in the developing countries. We don't have this kind of the facilities. The, the cost to try to deploy this kind of the facility in this kind of countries, and will it increase the price of the food? We are increasing the price of the of the batteries of the electronics and, thermo, and, 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 and tires, for example, because finally, finally, who is paying you for that? They are not paying the big brands. This is the main problem of that. Finally, the final destination and the, the countries in the final destination that converting in the landfills of the important good because we don't have the facilities, for example, or the capabilities and skill for the social inclusion. We don't have the, 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 the facilities for sorting, for example. And finally, the big brands are trying to move in ahead into the recovering energy and materials, but finally they are transferring the prices to recovering of the different materials for the consumers. And in this country, we have a big inequity of the income. So in the middle class and the, and the low, on the low middle class are paying for sorting and paying for recovery materials. And we don't have secondary markets and the, this kind of material never come back for the manufacturers. So we never close the loop because we never thought that we are talking about the global supply chain. Always when we talk about the, the, the circular economy, we think in the and supply chain, supply chain, yeah, okay, but this is a global supply chain. You have the headquarters in developed countries, and the manufacturers in another part of the world, and the final destination, the global south, needs to recover the materials and maybe creating some, some and, 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 and circular flow, but their materials never come back for the manufacturers or for the big brands. So we need to reduce the big, the big gap between um, rich countries, poor countries 
and into the middle class because finally are the consumer who is paying that the big brands are not paying today. This is my, my, my view in the, in the global south and the final destination. Thank you, Nicolas. Thank you very much, Alexander. This is also a, a very complimentary and very strong view. Um, and I think what comes out of this discussion is rather crystal clear about a number of flows in the global supply and value chains for the development of circular economy. Najma Mohammed, getting back to you uh, regarding uh, how institutional work through the UN or regional partnerships could include those social dimensions into uh, the much needed uh, uh, input of circular economy to reach out seriously to the climate goals. Najma. Thank you, Nicola. So I, um, I think definitely we need to establish stronger global norms for supply chains that integrate social labor and environmental rights. We have the UN guiding principles on business and human rights. We've got a, a number of ILO conventions that speak to the um, you know, just and, and equitable supply chains. And I think um, in 2021, we had a landmark agreement that's a right to a healthy environment. It's a, it's, it's a basic you know, human rights across the world. And so I do think we need to build this into, I mean, there are some countries have passed national leg legislation in France, Germany, and Netherlands that begin to hold their companies to account um, not only the activity within their national jurisdictions, but outside as well. And I think that's critically important. We need lots of domestic legislation that, that does that. And then just building on the point previously, I do think that we need the policy and the regulatory and the um, capabilities to be enhanced in, um, in lower income countries to make sure that um, we acknowledge that this is not an, a, um, a level playing field that we are entering, that there are inequalities between countries and we need to really structure trade you know, in an, in, in an equitable way. And I, I think we cannot speak about circularity just from a technical um, perspective. Um, one of the ideas that we discussed um, at, at, at the sort of policy lab that I was part of um, about this topic actually spoke about an internationally crowdsourced database with information about supply chains, enabling one to track, you know, whether the supply chains are adhering to environmental and social um, and, and human um, rights. Um, and, and then I, I do think that um, I spoke about this earlier, Nicola, but this idea of, of building, you know, um, uh, just business model, you know, changing, you know, com completely. Um, and then also in, um, this issue of, of solidarity, you need, a, you need a mixture of policy regulation, um, you know, consumers um, uh, demanding, but also workers um, and, and employers, um, you know, beginning to realize companies need to be aware that complying with human and environmental standards along the full supply chain, they enhance the value and standing of, of, of business. And they also begin to you know, become um, front runners in, in creating the kind of business models that, that should be at the core of, of these new economic models. So you need, I think, shifts at multiple levels. Thank you. Thank you very much, Najma. This is also very, very, very clear. And I'm now turning to um, Isabella Teixeira. So we have started with this overview that Charles made regarding the multiple uh, uh, problems about really reaching out to a circular economy and uh, on the one hand we can see um, with uh, Neil Gunn and Astrid uh, it was very clearly a changing panorama right regarding uh, um, rising awareness uh, of the need to develop circular economy at the heart of the question at the heart of the equation uh, both Mohamed Rivindo and Alexander Godoy and Najma highlighted different issues that are linked to the deficit of uh, uh, social perspectives uh, and MSME's engagement, especially in this specific moment of recovering from the COVID and so on. Uh, that might definitely alter uh, the capacity of global supply chains to contribute to circular economy. What would be your, I would say, impressions or recommendations, uh, remarks um, to kind of close this discussion among so many regarding circular economy? Isabella, the floor is yours for five minutes. Okay, thank you very much, Nicola. Thank you very much, other uh, panel members that really have uh, excellent um, uh, contribution and also excellent debate. I'd like uh, to highlight two or three things uh, to observe uh, 
something that is happening today. And in my personal experience, I do believe that we need to understand this contest to move forward with circular economy. Everyone's discussed here the circular economy is a solution. So why it's so difficult uh, <laughs> to move this? And, uh, and so of course, that to have some questions, some aspects that should be observed. The first one is how to deal with the short term perspective. And this is very important to observe because you have the pressure of the past, okay? In the present and probably you're looking forward to stay in the future. And you know that the future is not more a linear projection of the past. Uh, you know that we have futures, a possible futures as the climate crisis makes clear for us. So this is the first point, it's a circular economy. is a solution, how to deal with the short term perspective. This is a big challenge. Okay, and I go into the short term perspective by second point. We cannot ignore what's happened today in the world uh, and uh, the transformative process that's coming that we need to deal with this. And uh, it's uh, and we have two important uh, movements that uh, uh, put the bring the lights and new lights to understand the challenge of multilateral system and how all the countries should come together to deal with the global environmental crisis. Because the global environmental crisis, they are planetary crisis. So it's impossible to have the solutions only between the United States and China, for example. We know this, and we have been discussed here the role of the global south. South, I think that I'd like to suggest to discuss the role of the green global south. Okay, because. This is a big challenge. We need to understand not only the social gaps, but how indeed the green global south or how the global south wants to come together or not, uh, considering these challenges that circular economy poses to us. I fully agree that we, as we highlighted in international resource planning, I think that as Trude mentioned this, the role of natural resource efficiency and management to deal with the global environmental crisis, meaning climate change, biodiversity law, and pollution. You know that we need to learn about our impact. We need to know uh, how to plan together, consider the short-term and long-term perspectives. You know that we need to grow with nature, not against nature, and need how to value nature. This is really some a cycle that have been debated in International Resource Panel, and it's really made clear for us that uh, uh, how to come with this to change our perspective of global solutions is a critical issue, not short-term perspective. But we cannot forget something, Nicola, that I, I think that's very important. We need to go beyond the green wishing, not the green washing, the green wishing that I think that we have this around the world. Okay, everyone <laughs> wants to move forward, but nobody knows how to manage this very well. And okay, and again, when you go into the global crisis, Syria pandemic crisis and also the war that we have today, we cannot forget the impact, the polit geopolitical impacts that, that happened today in the world, and this go into supply chains. Uh, as in the past, we used to address supply chains to reduce costs. Uh, uh, now, I think that we are going to supply chains to minimize risks, okay? And uh, means that probably the global debate is showing that, that uh, uh, the hyper-globalization is over, as mentioned uh, this last week. And so the country is looking for, uh, for self-sufficiency. It's some interesting also or to work closer some groups. Okay, uh, so you have the multilateral system, but probably you have really concrete actions on regional aspects or some groups like G20, OECD, et cetera, et cetera. Like-minded groups are coming, okay, with really huge uh, 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 efforts to drive solutions considering climate change, but uh, the environment and climate change uh, 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 challenges or, or crisis. And in my, in my perspective, we need to understand how you manage that just transition to circular economy considering these new perspectives. And this is very interesting to observe because I do believe that G20 and G7 must have to find a way to dialogue into new perspectives, not to only put pressure on developing countries to go against or pro the situation, the short-term perspective that we have today. We need to understand how the societies, not only the governments, we were looking for to come into the solution. And I think the climate driver uh, uh, play really an important, an important uh, challenge. We cannot forget that in my personal opinion, again, that you have this pressure on multilateral systems, but this means that you have changed into the multilateral system, but you are not changing the system. This is a different debate, the geopolitical debate that's coming. In my impressions, I do believe 
that uh, circular economy will have a role or has a role to try to bring things together and to make clear how you emerge a new business model, how indeed we go beyond GDP, how indeed we can manage better uh, just uh, social and inclusive development around the world. This is not easy because this is really very different. And uh, you know that nature obliges things but to change, but not necessarily people have the same expectation about nature. And we go with developing world that have natural resource assets. We need to understand the role of private sector to be part of this uh, as a game changer, not as one that wants to protect or to preserve the short term perspective. My last comment to back to you, okay, Nicola. I know that don't have much time. Please don't forget what's happening in the world. Consider the emergence of the populism and the new nationalism, the protectionism that to come. These movements come from middle class. So you mentioned here the importance of consumers, okay? And it's very important to understand how the middle class will act, okay? Because all the data that we have around the world, the political ones shows that the middle class in the Western world uh, wants to preserve some assets in such a way that this, the new generation, their sons can have the same chance in the future. And they know, okay, two thirds of the middle class know that unfortunately their children do not, do not have the same chance that the parents had in the past, the same opportunities. It's very important when to go into this debate of circular economy, please consider the geopolitical arrangements and how the political issues connect things. In my country, in Brazil, we have to deal with this because we have the extreme right government now. It is a clear expression, really clear expression that what's happening in a country like Brazil, that needs to understand better what the society wants, what the expectations of society wants, and what, how the, the world is looking for to address common understanding or common perspectives together with Brazil. We're having different roles today and circular economy, again, should come to facilitate and to make clear the opportunities, not the barriers and not the past. The future, uh, uh, we need to bring the future to the present, as I used to say, and circular economy is a good password for this. Back to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, um, Isabella. Uh, and uh, it's quite interesting to see how much the society issues that were repeatedly put up front in this discussion about global value chains, right? So um, this is one very clear lesson on how to develop the issue of, uh, of, um, of circular economy and to close the loop, we're using Charles Wong uh, uh, opening words. Maybe, uh, Charles, you started with this uh, passing on on the externalities, privatization of profits, uh, uh, extractive economy problems, the issues of um, uh, capacity building and inclusion have been also, education have been brought up many times. Uh, maybe a final word to wrap up this discussion, Charles? Yes, uh, thank you, Nicholas. I think it's quite exciting to hear what everybody is talking about, and there's great consensus and agreement among us uh, on a couple of things. One is that we all recognize the deficiencies or destructiveness of or degenerativeness of the current economic, economic model. And we need to transition to a circular one. And there are two key words characterize circular economy. And actually one is inclusiveness, since a lot of people talk about social issues. And I'd like to remind all the speakers, actually the best way to solve social justice issue is actually to change the economic model uh, that we are familiar with from linear to circular. Okay, so in other words, circular economy does not create social injustice. It actually, it will address the social injustice issues if we go at it systematically. Okay, that's, that's the point I think I wanted to, to mention. And the second layer is that how do you do that? And we talk a lot about the value chains. In circular economy, the value chain is likely to be more regionalized as opposed to existing one it's a globalized one. And the globalized one today is a linear for the reason that it actually is quite attractive. You know, some uh, previous speakers talk about you know, brand owners uh, actually passing on the externalities and, and to, to downstreams. And as I mentioned earlier in my opening remark, that's what happened in the linear one. Okay, brand owner passed on the externalities to the producers, producers to the 
to the component manufacturers and then to the raw material suppliers. Anyway, so in short, I think circular economy is the solution to many of the problems people talk about and we need to move forward and accelerate. Thank you very much, Charles, and a lot of interesting thoughts, hopefully for you, Neil Gruntas with Unido and Astrid uh, with the European Commission. Thank you very much uh, for um, our speakers, Mohamed also Dian Rivinto with the University of Indonesia, Alexander Godoy, Godoy Foundé, sorry, from Universidad de Desarrollo in Chile, and Najma Mohamed from the Green Economic Coalition in the UK, and Isabella Tessera for projecting a way forward uh, that is different from looking back. So thank you very much uh, for following this discussion. Stay tuned for the other segments uh, during the Global Solutions Summit about circular economy uh, in very critical times. Thank you very much again, and I'm looking forward to continuing these discussions. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay.